So welcome everyone to this talk named Some Things C++ Does Right. I hope you're in the right room and that's what you were planning to, to go for or go to. So my name is Patrice. As you can see, my email addresses are in the slide right now, which will be made available to you after the uh, event, of course. If you've never been to my talks, and you, or if you don't know me, well, I have a few kids. You will see some of them. Well, you see, oh, you will see all of them. In fact, in the slides that will come, because they're part of the presentation today. A number of animals. You will see a few of them too, for some reasons. Uh, I, I used to write military flight simulators in the past and do uh, R and D, but I've been a professor for over twenty years now, and this is pretty much what's. Uh, bringing this talk uh, to the fore uh, today. And I'm also, uh, incidentally, a WG21 member who hasn't been to the last two or three meetings because I've been very busy with the pandemic and such, such stuff. So let's start. <clears throat> you, you can see my beautiful wife here and one of the animals named Gracie. These uh, things we do right, like my kids and animals and such things, or things that are right in life will be part of the presentation to give it some color because the slides are white to contrast with the black slides that I had yesterday. So you might have heard that C++ is not good for many reasons, not memory safe enough, you'll see that, not type safe enough, you'll hear people complain about this. Some, uh, it's a language where some defaults are wrong or even as some people say, all defaults are wrong. You can see that sometimes, I see that pass by. Whenever people tweet to me or write to me because they hate C++ and tell me you should use something else instead. Too expert friendly. I hear that even from experts, which is true. Uh, Herb's talks later today, Herb's talk later today will be about how we simplify C++. Uh, he's working on things, many of us are. So yeah, people may be too expert friendly, although my talk last year was about how it's, you don't have to be expert to do C++. There's things about that. So, so, so there's truth. There's some kind of truth in there uh, because yes, C++ has warts and it, it, it has to have warts. You know, it has history, it covers a wide, wide range of application and domains and lots of people work on it from the very low level to the very high level. It's high performance, it can do safety critical stuff. So yeah, it's, when, you, when you go that, that wide, you're bound to have warts. But, the, but we do a number of things right. There's a significant number of things that we do right. And, and there's a number of reasons to love this language. <clears throat> I love this language. That's one of the reasons why I'm here, that why you're there, I guess. We like it enough to get together, even virtually, to, to talk about it and try to understand it better. We enjoy coding in C++. There has to be something good about it. So, so this is a talk about the things that we do right. It's not exhaustive in any way, okay? Just as an example, I, I put this small tweet there that you can see right now when I was trying to promote my class that I gave last week, my CBCon class, uh, class about managing memory. And I had this, uh, memory management is one of the things some use to give C++ a bad name. And I was trying to put forward that you can do something cool with it. I had an immediate reaction by Jan, who uh, was a very nice guy. He said, well, I thought it was one of the good things about C++ that we can like, manage memory, manage resources tightly. He said, well, yeah, some say that. I don't. I like it. I think we do the right thing. So, so it's not an exhaustive list. Far, far, far from it. We do a number of cool things, and we do a number of bad things, I know, but this is about the good stuff, some of the good stuff. There will be comparisons with other languages, so you will see some C-sharp and Java code in there. Quite a bit of C-sharp because I do more C-sharp these days for school reasons. But, but it's not a C++ is good and the others is ba are bad. It's more about the things that I like in C++ and then I miss when I'm not there. When I'm stuck doing something else, I miss C++ a lot. So, and I won't make anyone believe that C++ is perfect. It's not, but it's cool. It's beautiful, it's fun, it's efficient. If you, if you use it right, and, and I miss it when it's not around. So, as I said, C-sharp is a fine language, Java is a fine language, JavaScript is a fine language, Python, SQL, C, they're all cool. Okay? So, so this I'm not bashing anyone, even though I'm going to take examples from other languages to make comparisons, they have good sides too. So let's talk about beauty and elegance. What you see there is Ludo. Ludo is now seven years old, you'll see him later in the, uh, the talk. He's, uh, well, he's my youngest son. I have four daughters and one son. 
So about beauty. Beauty is hard to describe when you're talking about programming languages. People will say, well, it's a bit uh, well, uh, cultural, maybe local, subjective. There's beauty in most programming languages, and C++ has beauty. So let, let's take this example for uh, for, uh, for sense. <clears throat> so we, we have this game. I work with game programmers, as most of you know, I guess. And we have this class hierarchy that we, in which we have objects stored in a pimple class. It's a design pattern, if you're looking for it, uh, an idiom that you will find in Herb's book, among other, Herb's books, among others. It's called monsters. You know, the monster. So a monster is something you can copy around that has polymorphic behavior inside, whatever. And so, so you have this, this fight in your game where there's a carnage. So, so, so a monster said to another monster, well, you smell good today. And the other monster got angry because it's not supposed to say that it's a monster. And they started fighting and there's death all over the place. So after that, you want to remove the dead bodies and keep the ones that are left alive. If you're doing C-sharp code, you could do something like this. So as I said, it's not a C-sharp bashing thing, but still. So, so th this is very easy. You look at this code and say, wait. Cute, simple, nice. I have this list. List there is not a linked list. In C-sharp, list is the name they give to what we call a vector. So it's a dynamic array. It's fast when you add at the end. It's very slow when you remove at the beginning or something. So you do remove all. You pass a lambda. This is the lambda C, uh, syntax of C-sharp. It's simple, but it's less powerful than what we had in C++. It does less things. <clears throat> so remove all the not alive ones. Is alive there would be a property in that language. So it's simple. It's nice. Why? Cool. I like it. Yeah, but... But you're in C-sharp, see? So, so that LST object there, it's not an object. It's a reference to a list. And you're sharing state. That thing shares state between the caller and the callee. So it's a mutable shared state. And you're affecting the code, the client code with this. So you have to think about your code. Was that the proper thing to do? It's something to think about. It's hard to reason on those things. If you're doing C++ code, it could look like this. So, I have this remove if algorithm in there that Mr. Stepanov has given us, among other things, Stepanov and his team. And I actually like this. So remove doesn't remove anything. If you're not familiar with this, it moves the well, it takes the things that you are not removing at the beginning and it returns P in this case, which is the, the position, especially the an iterator to the first one that you are not keeping. So from beginning to P is what you keep. So it's a good algorithm, does the job if you know what you're doing. You could, of course, use erase and other things like that. And then when I'm done, I keep the live ones. I'm using the uh, sequence constructor in this case that takes a pair of iterators, a range, and creates a different vector from it. So supposing that my, my, uh, my monsters copy well, this is actually pretty cute. And I'm working locally. So I'm working with my v passed by value, Maybe it's been moved into my function, which would be the right thing to do, probably in this case. And I'm reasoning locally, locally, so I'm avoiding the sharing state that we had in the C-sharp code. I like this. I like this code. So if you compare both, the C++ code is a bit longer to write, but if you look at both, it, has, it is more general. It could apply to other things than just a, a vector. It's not uh, tied to a specific member function. It's a general algorithm that works on iterators. And uh, they generalize differently. See, the C sharp code is smaller, but it's specific. The C++ code is more general. It's a bit longer to write, but it's still two instructions. If you look at it, two instructions in both cases, a call to remove if and a return in our case. I like this. I like this because we can build from basic principles with it. We'll go back to that. There. There. The other interesting thing in this case is that, as I said, we're working on iterators. That's the genius of Alexander Stepanov. <clears throat> so we're not tied to vector. We could be using something else. There are rules, of course. Uh, ben has discussed this in his talk earlier this week. But, uh, ben Dean. But yeah, it's, it has this nice upside. So one of the things that C++ does well is allow us to compose elegant and efficient solutions from basic sets of principles. I like this. It's not a case-by-case -case kind of language. It's not, at least not, not the, the, the standard library and the algorithms that we love to use. Let's take another solution. So you want to read all of the text, all of the text from a text file, and you want to make a big string out of this. So C Sharp is a simple function for that. It's called read all text. It's a static, static function of class file. Then there's no such thing as a read all text in the C++ standard library, of course, because that's not how we do things. So if you look at this C Sharp code, 
the using static and the third lines to make the code fit on a slide. <laughs> it allows me not to write console that right down there. So let's just read all text. And I'm reading the text from a file. <clears throat> I'm putting it on screen. So it's simple, but someone did this for us. Someone wrote this function. If you want to write it in C Sharp, it's tricky. It's not very difficult, but it probably won't be the most beautiful piece of code you will have written in your life. The C++ equivalent of this, I think, looks like this. So the, you might see the read all text there, it takes the file name, opens the file, and returns, well, a string made from the contents of the file using, again, again the a pair of iterators and creating something with the sequence constructor. So my read all text, well, it's a two-liner. It's cute, nice, and built from the same basic general principles as the return statement from the previous function. It's only missing includes. It's all there. So there's no special case saying it would work under, well, it works with the same principles as the previous case. And if you look like this, uh, I personally like this. It's less flexible, of course, because it's a hard coded literal, but you might think it's cool. You might think it's ugly. I've heard both. But if you look at the entire code, the, the whole code to get this result. It's a single function with a one-liner that delegates to the other function that we just wrote. So we can build extremely powerful and surprising abstractions from very simple basic stuff, which I like. I think it's beautiful. I think it's elegant that we can do this. You might not want to do this, but that we can is actually pretty nice. Yeah, nothing more. So there's beauty about this. There's beauty, there's elegance. That doesn't mean frameworks that give you a whole set of functions on a case-by-case -case basis are bad. They allow people who don't want to get the basic principles to get along with their lives and do stuff simply. But still, you know, still. Let's take another one. So you, you, you might have seen something like this if you went to David Senkel's talk yesterday because he has essentially the same code under another name because he was talking about uh, monadic programming. Um, it wasn't the monad though. <clears throat> so you want to apply a composition of function. You want to do f of g of x for some set of x's in a range. So replacing the two calls to transform at the top there, applying g and then apply, applying f, to one that does the composition of both, to have only one traversal of your sequence instead of having two, you know, to make it a bit simpler and a bit faster, maybe. And this might have some other upsides. Uh, the RVO I'm mentioning is not tied to transforms for some other reason. And you look at this, and it's actually quite simple. You know, with current C++, of course. So yeah, I like it. A function that takes two functions, creates a lambda that will take anything, and pass it to G, which will pass it to F and return the result. It's very simple, very cute. We can do that without much effort in C++. It used to be more complicated, no, but be, uh, be, be careful, because this is what it used to look like with C++ 14 and before. It was a bit more uh, painful, before C++ 14. And I cheated on this one, because I used auto as return type, which is C++ 14. But with 11, <clears throat> when you had to write all of the scaffolding, the return type was, was a pain. So yeah. In C Sharp, it looks like what you see at the, in the blue, uh, blue stuff uh, down there. So it's not that much more complicated or that much more simple. The complexities are different a bit, I'd say. But you get all of the function signatures. So the way to read this is G takes a T and returns a U. F takes a U and returns an R. So you have a generic function F of G of X that will uh, return a function that takes a T and returns an R. So T to U to R. The lambda in there is very simple, though. The calling code is not beautiful <clears throat> in C Sharp. You have to explicit the types when you call for something like this. It's not able to deduce everything because it's trying to check the contracts from the caller to the callee uh, at call point, and it cannot do this in this case. It's not able to. Maybe someday. I don't know. So if you compare both, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't say that one is more complicated than the other. You have things to understand in both cases. When you call them both, well, which one is more beautiful? I don't know. 
But I, I do like the C++ version. The way it's expressed, it uh, it uh, makes me more comfortable not to, not to have to explicit the types there because they can get pretty hairy in C++ sometimes, the types. Yeah. And of course, you can tell me, well, if you really want to do a good job, you have to forward the stuff in there, or then it gets more complicated to explain to people. Yeah, well, yeah. C++ it gives you control. It does. I like it. I don't think it's a word. I think it's a feature. But yeah, it can be something you can take against the language or for it, but I like it. I like that we can control this and we're all not always taking everything by reference like in other languages because that has other problems. So yeah, you want to apply a function in sequence for each argument of a function. This one is not for me. So you have a function that takes a function and a number of arguments and applies the function to each of the arguments. This, this wasn't from me, but it's, it's, it's so beautiful I had to mention it. It's from uh, Sean Parent. So there's a number of syntactic elements in there, but look at this. It's on isocpp.org if you want to see it. It's from 2015. So there's this empty lambda there that takes anything. It's an ellipsis and does nothing with it. It's just there to make place for a call to something. And what will the arguments that lambda that is being created and destroyed, what will they be, these arguments? Well, what you see there. So it's a fold expression over operator comma using f for each argument. And the comma zero is to have a long set of integers, quite simply. And these integers are passed to the lambda that does nothing with it. This, section, this whole code actually fits in a tweet. So you might like, you might not like, but that we can express such complex ideas in such a generic way or general way makes me very happy. No, so yeah, now is it beautiful? Is it clever? Is it both? You tell me. But I like that we can do it. Yeah. I don't have a C example, a C sharp example of this because I don't think you can express that in C sharp. If I'm mistaken, write to me. I'm, I'm curious to know how it's done. But very in C sharp, well, I don't think it will do what you think it does. This is my son today. Well, today. <clears throat> recently, because the, 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 the cat you see in his hands is a big cat now. One of the strengths of C++ is that it's value-based. I really like this. I took this tweet from Michael Case uh, in August, who, who complained about reference semantic languages. I agree with him. So I, I like that C++ favors direct access over indirections. You can do pointers, you can do references in C++. We do that, but it's up in. It's not what we have by default. I think the fact that we have to make an effort and add syntax to get reference uh, semantics is a good thing. I think we're doing this right compared to some other people. It influences the way we code because we have objects, not references to objects in our code, at first at least. So yeah, some people will criticize initialization in C++ saying, yeah, it's complicated, there's many ways. Because we have values, we have to take care about uh, of constructors. When we're writing string s, it's a string. It's a reference to a string. But other languages have their words too. Check it out. This series of, of initializations, there are ways to initialize an int. So x0 has an unknown value. x1, 2 have 0. x3 is not an initialization. It's a function. That's, that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. You know, it's a function prototype. X4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, they're all ints of value 0. So, so there's many ways to do this, and people could complain about this, saying, why do we need so many initialization means? There might be others, and think about it. With strings, it's similar, but slightly different. We still have the function on S3, and S0 is an empty string. When I wrote this with my integer i0 and didn't initialize it, I had an uninitialized thing. But the rest is mostly strings. Now there's a catch with S6, if you look at it, because S6, it's not a string. It's a reference to an array of chars, or if it decays in this case, because there's auto, it's a const char star. So yeah, it's complicated, you see. Well, this is C-sharp to say it's simpler, because S0 is no, I guess, but it depends on the context, because if you use S0 like this in a function, it's not initialized, and it's an error to use it. But if you use it in an object that you have to create with new, it will be null initialized because that's the default value. So S1 is null. S2 is an empty string. It's not null. 
S3, well, it's default, but default in C sharp because it's a reference type. It's not. It's not an empty string. New string parent parent doesn't compile. There's no such constructor in C sharp for string, but parent quote quote parent is an empty string, and it's equivalent to S2 in this case. So there's less cases, but I wouldn't say it's easy to grasp at first because there's corner cases and weird stuff to think about there. This is amusing, though. <clears throat> Look at it. If you think we have the defaults wrong, think about this. Here I have a null s in C sharp. I do s dot length, which is a property with that gives me the length of string, like our size function, and it goes boom because it's null. If you look at this, you have a null, and you do plus equals with something, it works fine. So you can do null plus equal as the string. Now you have to know things. This is not trivial to me. I don't know if it's trivial to you. But what happens is that there's a rewrite. See, when you do plus equals, it doesn't really exist because it's showing in C sharp. It rewrites your thing to s equals s plus yo. S is an, a string. Strings are immutable. And the operator, that's the way it behaves. When it's overloaded, it re rewrites your code with the operator plus. It's very hard to do efficient code in that language. And because the operator plus, which has a string and a null string, a null for reference, well, its behavior is to give you the string that's non null. Well, you have length too. So maybe it's self evident to you, maybe it's not, but I don't think it's trivial. This one is more amusing. So you have a null, plus equals a null gives you, of course, an empty string. And then you can call length, and it works. That, to me, is icky. That feels bad to me. And teaching the things students do that and scratch their heads is a bit weird to me. But hey, to each language its own words. So I think we have a saner model for initialization that people will create it for. Even though it has words and it's complicated, I know. Look at this. <clears throat> so I have this integral class that, by default, initializes the value uh, data member with create value. And create value outputs something on screen right now just to show that we passed there. There's the default constructor down there that, that init default initializes the thing in a kind of a way. It calls create value. And there's the uh, constructor that takes an int argument that initializes value with the int. Well, if you look at this code, i0 will call create value, but i1 will not. I think that's same. If you're passing an argument to the thing, you don't expect the default value to be applied. You expect the value you gave. Why do some wasteful initialization before you construct the thing? But that works because in C++ we have objects, the references to objects. It's a different world. Yeah. This is C-sharp code. <clears throat> Again, I'm not C-sharp bashing. I'm talking about differences in, in meaning. So it's similar, if you look at it. Create value, print something on screen, and returns the default int, which is 0. Uh, <clears throat> the property named value, it has only a get, so it's not modifiable once the object is constructed. And it's default initialized, in a way, to create value. So it's going to call create value for the initialization. My default constructor, the public integral that you see there with uh, empty parents, it will call create value. But the integral that you see at the end, the one that takes an int argument, funny enough, if you look at the code, it will call create value and then replace it with the uh, parameter, the argument. You will see two calls to create value. Now, in this case, it's very simple. It's returning an int with value 0. We could do away with the function. But the interesting thing here is that you will get the wasteful call. You don't have any choice. If you put it there, you've got to get there for everyone, regardless of what happens afterwards. So we have values by default. We have to make an effort to get pointers and references. And our objects, they actually construct their data members because they can call their constructor. They're not references to things. By default, they're objects. This is bad C++ code because it's default constructing the name, name with the underscore at the end, and then replacing it with an assignment, which removes what was there and puts something else instead. So it's wasteful. This is better C++, but we can do that in C++ because we have objects, again, and we're constructing them at first. When you're using something like C Sharp or Java, it's a different mindset. So you have references. Uh, your values will be zero initialized when you do new. And this will give you essentially a null value when you're within pointers. So something like this, if you do a new person, 
well, your name will be set to null initially, even though you initialize it in the constructor systematically. So you paid for the zero initialization regardless of what you're going to be doing. That's how it works. On the other end, name equals name with the big N and the small N, it copies a pointer essentially because it's a reference-based thing. So you're not copying a string, you're copying a reference to a string. And strings are immutable, so that's fine. And if you do a generate name function that does some computation, and you, let's quote, quote by mistake because you don't realize what's going on, call it on all name properties, well, your initialization in the constructor, well, it will always call generate name. Of course, this wouldn't make sense if there wasn't a default constructor somewhere else, but anyway. So the point is you're always paying for this. C++ doesn't do this. So I, I think there's a same model that we have. Another tricky thing that we get from value semantics is the way the fact that we can reason locally on code. It's much harder to do that with reference-based languages, particularly when you have mutable state, because non-mutable state, it's not really a problem, especially with generic code. So this is some kind of smallish collection uh, in C-sharp. So bag of T, it's holding a list of T in there. So get means it's only initialized at construction time, not after that. You can just read for a bit afterwards. But remember, list is, an, is a class, so like a vector, and you get a reference to it. So when you're calling the get to the thing, it's you're sharing state with the others. This is the C-sharp way of doing a operator bracket bracket uh, <clears throat> overloading. It's called a, uh, an indexer. That's okay. And the get, again, means that I can only uh, read the values in the array. I cannot write to them. So uh, it will return the nth element of contents. That's okay. And there's this constructor there that takes a list of t. And make sure that it has uh, five elements and less because I want a small bag. And if it's too big, I'm forgetting an exception, I could use a better type than just exception. That would be fine. Th there's so many bugs in this code. It looks simpler until you do something real with it. So this, this evil function, see, it creates a list of five elements, creates the bag with it, that's totally fine, it's all ints. And then it adds another element to the list, your local list in evil, which is now shared by bag, because that's reference semantics at their worst. So you just broke the invariant from the outside. You're an attacker because you're doing something like this. To defend itself against that, the bag would have had to create internally, manually speaking, a new list and copy the elements and hoping the elements are either what they call structs, uh, value types, or, or that they're immutable. Otherwise, they're still fragile. This is another breaking thing. So I have this bag of uh, that takes a list with two things, and there are three things in there, two, three, five. But thing is a mutable object. If you, you can know that if you look at thing at the top part, because there's a public val with a set, so it's mutable. So when I do bag, at the end, at the bottom, bag, square bracket, two, square bracket, dot val, and I modify the thing, I mutate the element inside my bag of things. So if that wasn't something I was planning to allow, I'm in trouble. But that's what you get when you get reference semantics by default. We get the same thing in C++ when we play with references and pointers. It's just not the default that we get. So it's, it's difficult to reason locally. It's like you have pointers everywhere. People say there's no pointers in Java and C-sharp. That's false. There's nothing else. And current currency is more complicated because of that. In modern C++, we tend to use reference semantics, but we don't, we're not forced to do it. We do, with move semantics, among other things, we can get more value-based reasoning. It's easier in many ways. Even pointers are encouraged to have unique ownerships. We use unique pointers more than shared stuff in general. So this is the C++ kind of equivalent of the bag. But if you look at it, it's, it's, it's safer because my operator square bracket, it returns a, a copy of t, and my constructor makes a copy of the values of the vectors. So it's kind of the same code, but without the problems. And with actual encapsulation that lacked in C-sharp. It's, it's trickier to do correct generic code in C-sharp than in C++. Yeah. Let's talk about free functions a bit. The, the kid that you see there is Veda. <clears throat> she's 13 now, she's in school right now, she's in high school, beautiful kid. So that was a few years back, let's put it that way. If she knows that I put it there, I'm gonna <clears throat> hear about it later on today. 
There was a vogue. Uh, I know when I was a student, there was a vogue saying everything should be in a class. If Maine is in a class, it's a better Maine or something. Yeah. So th th this, th the problem in this case is the same with C Sharp or Java. I'm not bashing C Sharp. It's interesting. There's actually something cute about it. So let's take this beautiful code. <clears throat> let's put it this way. There's this super math class that has a static function named square that takes an int and returns the square of an int using system.math.tau. And main calls this thing and does super math the square two. There's a lot of noise in the code. Huh? And you, you can ask yourself, why are there classes in this case? They, well, there's nothing related to class-based programming in there. It's just functions, you know? But they're, they're required originally, at least. But there's been efforts. So now they have static classes that you cannot instantiate and that can contain only static members. They're kind of closed namespaces of sorts. So you can put static there. <clears throat> and static is still in your function. And you're still calling supermassive squared. That's fine. That's, so that's a start. We haven't gained much from that. But now we can do using static with C-sharp. So when you're doing using static, you're doing shortcuts for the member function, the static member functions of the static classes, but only these, such that you can avoid putting the name at front. So if you're doing using static super maths, like you see there, look in main, you don't have to write super dot square, you can just write square because you have using static, it's a shortcut. And you can continue. This is cool. If you use using static system.console, then in main you can just do write. You don't have to do console.write or system.console.write. Cool. And if you push it further, you can do using system.math. And then you can just write tau in super math instead of writing system.math.tau or just math.tau. But look at this code. If we had functions, we'd be done. <laughs> So all this work, uh, the, this, the, some of this comes from C sharp eight or nine or something. All this code to get to functions. I like functions. Sometimes functions are what you need. Sometimes they're the right thing. So yes, it looks novel, but it's a lot of work to get to where we were 40 years ago. The, the, the guy, forget the guy at the, the, the back end who hasn't shaved that day, but the girl in front of you is Calypso. She's daughter number two over four. Veda is daughter number four, the one we used earlier. And the dogs that you see there are still with us. If you hear dogs yelping, these are the ones. They're called Obi-Wan, the brown one. He's not very intelligent, but he's very sweet. And the uh, she's two in front is uh, Gracie. I really like const. <clears throat> I really like const. I really like const correctness. Now, the, I talked about that in my other talk the other day. Uh, the fact that we can say something like this member function will leave the object unmodified when you call it, it's brilliant. But not everyone agrees with me. See, <clears throat> there's a big quote that I won't read for you. I'm going to tell you where it comes from, though. A big quote that explains why some other languages don't use const. I'm, I'm going to put a part of it like bigger. See? It's, this part says, if you declare a method that takes a non-const block, you can't pass it a const block. So you're stuck. You gradually need a const version of everything that isn't a const. And you end up in a shadow world. So, so those of you who were with me yesterday, you might recognize something there. So, so th th there's something wrong there. <clears throat> Not again, see my other talk. But the guy who wrote that thing, he's not dumb at all. I mean, the guy who wrote C-sharp, he wrote, he wrote the Delphi and TypeScript. So he's a brilliant guy. This is actually taken from an interview in 2004. I understand the point of view. I know that there's other reasons why they don't have constant C-sharp. They have const, but not in the sense that we, we intended in C++. <clears throat> but he's not, he's not dumb. It makes sense in the mindset that he has. But, but there's something cool about this. And he's, he's right in the fact that we, we need ways to circumvent const in some cases. Uh, so we have mutable, we have constcast. There's things like this that we need to be productive. We can opt out locally, but, but it still works. The fact that you can opt out of it doesn't mean it's bad. It works. Many languages go by without const. I mean, Java is final. <clears throat> so you can make references immutable, but not necessarily the referred objects. You can do set values on them if you get the final reference, but still it's useful. C sharp is read-only. <clears throat> it makes, again, references, not the referred to objects immutable, but it, it has something. And you can do const for some things too. 
but not everything, some things. So const int makes sense, and it's always static. You don't, you cannot write static, you have it by default. So th th this, this is a bit of C-sharp code. <clears throat> the integral class that you see there, the point of it is that the value is mutable. So you have get and set, people write code like this. I, I, I'm not bitching, by the way. Uh, if you look at two string with the arrow function, the arrow notation for things that just have a return, I, I kind of like that. I think with the operator dot in C++, we could get something that's cute like this. So this, this, this is actually nice. So you have an integral class that's mutable. Look at it. I have my point class there <clears throat> that has read-only integrals, x and y, and the properties, big x and big y, lets you access, uh, without modifying them, the, uh, the uh, data members. Let's put it that way, uh, x and y. The point constructor creates new integrals. So the point in this case, to make a bad pun, is to have an immutable point of source, which is not achieved. I can tell you the, this right now. The reason it's not achieved is that the x big x thing gives me access to the x small x thing, which is read-only, but that does not prevent setting the state of this thing. I just cannot re change the reference for something else. So if you look at the code that you have right there, I'm making a point two three, and when do I when I do pt dot x, that's an immutable reference, but the referred object is totally mutable and value plus plus changes the value of the point. So it's difficult to do something like this, at least with classes. You can do it with structs sometimes, because C-sharp makes a difference between classes and structs. So, so the, the, the real problem in this case is that it's lacking value semantics. If you're playing with classes, you lose value semantics. Yeah, it's, you're playing with pointers. But people, a lot of people do code like that and they don't think about it because they think they have objects in their mind, but uh, in their hands. But you almost never have objects when you're playing with these languages. You have references to objects. Your mindset is reference-based. This C++ version of the thing is value-based. So my integral as an int, I don't have a set. It's, it's by design. I want it to be mutable of sorts. Uh, I have operator, uh, <clears throat> the operator to put it on an output stream to display it. Fair enough. I don't think there's any big difficulty. My point there is two integrals. My x and y accessors of sorts return copies of the integral. OK, it's value-based. And I cannot modify my point the way it's written in this case. Of course, if I make an effort, now this is small, but the point is, if I want to put pointers in there, if I want to make the effort of making it, um, uh, providing it with indirect semantics, and some people do that on purpose, because like, they think there's a way to do object-oriented programming. Don't ask. Well, the constructor might leak. If you don't understand why, you can come and talk to me. I'll tell you why. I had to make it uncopyable. If you look at the middle midsection of point, there's two equal delete there because I have to. If I make it, uh, if I make it copyable, I have to write a copy constructor to copy the referred two objects and everything. I put the uh, const, but returning references x and y just to make a point in this case. Like I'm, I, the, the the functions are const but they're returning references to the pointers so I can do dirty things with them. And I have to make a lot of syntactic effort to get reference semantics in C and C++ and pointer semantics, <clears throat> which is good. I mean, if you want to do something like this, that's to be painful. It's not fun. The natural code is value-based. And when I make all of this effort, well, I introduce problems like the one you see in the bold part, uh, the bold face part of the code, it becomes mutable. So yeah, value-based by default, is a very good idea. It lets you reason locally. If I use a unique pointer, it's still more complicated. And if I do a auto ref in my x and y functions in the middle there, well, I'm still getting problems. I can't return a copy of these things, see, because they're unique pointers, so I have to return references. <clears throat> if I return const refs, I, I, I might be in better state. But if you look at this code, there's, it's less fragile than the other previous version, but still a lot of work. Value is easier in C++. And I can still do something like what you see in the boldface code, in this case, because I return references to my unique pointers. And when I'm modifying the contents in there, <clears throat> it's because I'm modifying the integral that I'm referring to, not the unique pointer itself. I could not call a non-cons function of the unique pointer, but what's in there, if it's accessible by ref, I can replace it. 
So nothing stopping me. So yeah, value-based by default is good. Because if I make efforts to point myself in trouble, it's nice that the simple code is the good code. So I love Kant. Kant plays well with value semantics, and C++ is a value-based language. Tony Van Eerd has told me that a few times, and I agree with him, except that he gave this talk, and I disagree with the talk. <clears throat> so, so, so Tony had this good talk. He's a very good speaker. So this talk in 2019 with objects which shows values, putting in front that C++ is a value-based language, but uh, and you can uh, I invite you to watch the talk. It's always fun to watch Tony. And in there, in this talk, he presents objects as reference types, kind of like C Sharp and Java do, and distinct from values. But I disagree. That's my point. In C plus plus, what you have by default are values. You make an effort to get out of it if you really want to. But still, go watch the talk. And he's got other good talks to me. <clears throat> the question came yesterday. Matter talk, it comes often. It comes often. Should cons be uh, opt out instead of opt in? Should it be the default? Well, we're in 2020, so we have hindsight. Maybe it's possible. Rust does that. <clears throat> it might be a good thing. Uh, from the 1979 perspective, it's not as clear to me, but this does not prevent us from doing a good job with const. We can do a good job. It's useful. It's not perfect, but it's useful. This is Veda again. She's 13 now. The cat there is minion. You should see the paws of that cat. It has like something like 10 toes per per, um, per, per hand or per paw. We, it, it's one of our oldest residents in the shelter, and we kept him because it's just too cool. He sleeps in the sink uh, in the kitchen because he wants water to be dripping instead of in a bowl. He's a huge cat. Friend. Friend is a controversial topic. I heard about it a few times this week, people saying, I don't get this. And some of you might not agree with my examples, but anyway, let's try this. So I read in books and I heard in uh, classes given by other people that friend is bad, dangerous, and breach of encapsulation, which I think is, is not true. It, it, well used, at least it enforces the encapsulation. It adds something to the code. So I just, you might, as I said, disagree with my example, but that's fine. So let's say we have a type that needs two-step initialization that exists. And that, that, that exists in real life, you know, a thread that you create and then start afterwards for some reason. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in some platforms, you want to get a resource like a window, and you have to call an init function on it afterwards. There were examples in the singleton code, uh, one of the talks this morning, that required that too. But it wasn't explained why, though. So it's like this. It's a two-step in a thing, a very good name <clears throat> that has a constructor that does not finish the job for some reason we don't know, and then an init function you want to call, and then use, of course. So the main that I have, uh, the bottom part there, well, it creates a default two-step in a thing, and then it calls init, and then uses as one should. But of course, as you know, programmers, they don't do as we should because they're programmers, so they have their own mindset. So if you leave it to programmer's discipline, you'll get what you deserve, see? They will do something like this. They will create and use and not call it because programmers are like that. They don't listen. They don't read the comments. That's what, that's what they do. You know that. So you look at the literature from the ancients and you say, oh, when you have a two-step thing, you could do a factory. So they say, hey, design pattern in books is bound to be good. So you want to make sure that init follows construction because that's what you plan to do. So you go there. You do a two-step init factory that creates inits and returns. Why not? Except that if you look at the code, the init and constructor are still public. So people could do it right, like you see there, and do what you asked. And people could do it wrong, of course, because people are bad. They don't listen. You, know, you give them tools and they don't listen. Anyway, it's part of life. So, so, so you could use friends, but if you don't want to use friends, you have options. So if you're in a language without friends, you have many options. So you can uh, use an interface. The C Sharp and Java way you will see normally. You have an interface, and you make sure that the class is only visible to the factory. So something like this. You have the usable interface with use. That's abstract. You have your two-step in the factory that returns a unique pointer to a usable, because you don't want to expose the details. And then your source file, you make two-step in a thing, some kind of usable. So you deface your design a bit by adding polymorphic behavior, and adding a base class and stuff. And your two-step in factory creates and initializes the two-step in thing and then returns it as a usable. So that works. Some people will consider that satisfying, but there's costs. 
You can also make two seven eight factory a class and make your two seven eight thing an inner class that we don't see from the outside, and then you still add the uh, overhead of the uh, interface, something like this. So you make it inside, and then you put your code in this. You could make it uh, a you can make uh, the factory function a um, a this code is bad because the uh, function should have a different name from the class. There's a bug in that slide. Anyway. You can add a static member factory function to your thing too, like this. So you put your static function inside the two-step thing. You push your constructor and unit functions to be private, and you make it so people have to write two-step thing colon colon, and then it would require another name again. There's a bug in the slide. Create say or something. But all of these solutions, they have a cost. You, you have to allocate because you end up doing a new, using a unique pointer in some cases. You have indirect calls. Um, you, you're restructuring your class to do something different than what was planned at first. It's a minor yet, but it's in it still. You could also wrap your two-step thing in another class and make a wrapper that in its constructor creates and initializes and then delegate from the outside to the inside the functions. There's a number of ways to solve this. Friend has the advantage of doing what you want, not more. So you can say, well, yes, init is private. The constructor is private. So if you want one, well, call the function that's my friend, and it will do the job. That's it. It has nice properties. So yeah, we can complain, but it's a nice property. Works well. Java has something else. Java has package private. So if you don't write anything, that's what you have. It's not the same thing as private, but it's public. So it's not the same rules. The rules are there, in fact. You can look at them. So with public, everyone has access. Predicted, it's you, your package, your subclasses. So package is the module in which you are, same. Uh, if you do nothing, it's yourself and the other classes in the same package. And it's, if it's private, it's only you. So that's the Java way of doing things. So we don't have the package concept in C++ yet. With module, maybe we'll have something like that. C Sharp has other things. It has internal, protected internal, private protected, different relations, but it's not a friend. So internal is everyone else in the same DLL. It's what you have by default, <clears throat> for at least for your classes and not the internals. A protected internal means, well, you, your child classes, and the ones in the same assembly. And private protected, it's you and your child classes, but those in the same assembly, not the other ones in the world. So there's nothing that says only you in there. So if you want to point fingers and say it's you and nobody else, you cannot do it. So it's more precise, but you have to be careful because you, know, you can have many friends. So if you do something like this in C++, it works today. And so in this case, all of the aficionado of T are friends of the popular. That's a bit aggressive. You have to know what you're doing if you're doing something like this. Because you see, and there is private. And if I'm using my own aficionado that does a fetch from a popular and returns the end there, <clears throat> if I wanted this to be hidden, well, uh, anyone can make an aficionado, an aficionado void and fetch from it. So, yeah. So if you do something like this, you open up a breach. You have to know what you're doing. But friend, by default, doesn't go that far. This is Amanzin. It's child number three of five for third daughter. There's upsides to iterators. I know that time is flying, so I'll try to go fast. Let's say you want to write your own reverse function. It's something you will see in Stepanov's book. <clears throat> C17 style, and you're using the new ranges there. So it looks like this. See, it's a very simple algorithm. You have beginning, end, and while they don't cross one another, you pull the ending uh, towards you. You compare them again in case something they, they, they're crossing one another. You're swapping the values and you know, something like this. Very simple. Look at this. It works with vector, works with list, works with deck, because it's a generic algorithm, algorithm based on iterators. It's the same function adapting itself to what uh, we pass it, as long as it's uh, reverse iterators. Uh, not reverse, but bidirectional iterators that you have. So it's essentially independent of the container. It has expectations, but it's limited. If you want to do this with C Sharp, and you want to do something general, you start. Say, OK, I have an enumerable, because that's the way it works, that has an interface for something that you can go through it for each thing. 
And then you look at the documentation. Well, you say with an enumerable, I can get an enumerator. And from that, I can, from there, I can move next. I can look at the current value and I can go back to the beginning, but there's, there's no end. There's no end. So, well, you can model easily in infinite sequence, but writing reverse is a lot trickier than it looks. It requires um, additional state. Let's say you have to allocate and stuff. <clears throat> so it's, 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 it's difficult to write properly, at least. You, you, can, you can add functions. There's something called system.link that adds uh, uh, methods from the outside, extension methods, and there's case-by-case -case implementations and virtual calls in there. So you, you can do it, but it's a very different philosophy. So there's elegance to iterators. We can express general algorithms. I mean, many of us love this thing, and you're not imposing yourself additional calls for virtual functions and such. If you want to make a list of int from an int array in C sharp, well, it's evident. You call to array dot to list. There's a specific function to get the list from an array. It's written like this. And if you want to get a list from an, an array from that list, you call to array. It's a case by case thing, and it works and is discoverable, and that's totally fine. It's a philosophy. If you use link queue, you are going to have other functions like this. <clears throat> There's a set. If you want to make a vector of int from an int array in C++, well, you call begin and end and use the range constructor like this. And if you want to make a list from the vector from the array, well, you do the same thing. It's general. It's general. You're not on the case-by-case -case thing, but you have to learn things at first, though. It's elegant. And you have to write only one per container, not one per type of thing you might want one day to go to or to, to, to convert to. That's kind of neat. <laughs> I'll let you uh, figure out what this is, but <clears throat> there's a few like that in my house from day to day. I, I really like variadics. These I really miss when I go to other languages. So we want to serialize a series of objects with standard output. We want to take objects and print them to a stream and make it quick. This is Java code. You see the dot, dot, dot thing? We have that in C++ too, but there's a different meaning. So in Java, when you do dot, 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 it will synthesize an array at the call site. So you have to have objects of the same type. Now, if you look at the example call, the print at the bottom of the page, you see, well, I have an int, a double, a string, and an x. <clears throat> it will work because everything is an object in C and Java, and object has two string, which is called by print. So this thing makes me an array of object. So it's allocating an array. The size is determined by the call site. It's actually neat. It's cool. So when you're paying for a few things there because int and double are not classes. So there's boxing, which creates class uh, objects in there. But anyway, it works. C sharp is similar. The params thing there with the array, it creates an array at the call site. But it's an array. So objects have to be all of the same type. See? That's the way it works. <clears throat> so so that's, it's, you, you get simplicity, but you pay for something. And again, objects in C-sharp have to string, so you can call to string on them with the for each thing. Same principle. C++ version might be harder to, to understand. I know this one is not the perfect version. It's simple. But it takes any number of arguments of any type and doesn't create an array. It just prints them. It's naive, but it's still cute. No conversion to string, no synthesizing an array. Simple. It's harder to write, I know. When I show this to people who are not used to C++, the wins. But the point is, it's very easy to use. Though. That's, that's the good thing, and there's no real cost. And with full expressions, it's even cooler. But that has to be explained to those who aren't used to it. But it's pretty nice. So I like it. I like the way that we can express things like this without incurring the costs. It get it, yeah, of course. So they're part, to me at least, of what makes the language beautiful. It's not an obvious syntax. You have to get used to it, but it makes you expressive. This function is totally useless. It's my last one in the talk. <clears throat> it's totally useless, but it's fun because it shows what you can do. You know, things you can do, not everything, of course. So it's a function that takes any number of integers as template parameters. I could put auto instead of int but int is what I want. 
You can make an array of the proper size. So this is a compiled time size because the number of ints is known when I compile my code. So that's totally fine. <clears throat> I can initialize the array with the values. It would make it context for if I felt like it. I don't even need to put the size of dot 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 anymore because the values are in a compiled time known number. Anyway. I can, of course, iterate through the array and print stuff. This is why my function is not context per because I'm printing. So that's OK. Or I can just iterate on an initializer list made of the values. And that works too, because initializer lists have begin and end. It's general. And if I want to return the sum of the values, well, I compute the sum of the value. If I remove the CRs from there, it's the context per function. The fact that we can express these things in C++ so simply makes me so happy. And when I move to other languages, I miss them so much. So a few words about fun and we're done. The tall girl at the left hand is Marguerite. It's child number one. And the other two are in order child number four and five. <clears throat> I like programming. I really like programming. I miss programming when I'm not doing it. I'm grading papers a lot these days and programming a lot less. The, the, the problem solving, the action, the act of doing this, I love it. I love building solutions from principles. I love using and writing algorithms. I love conceiving containers. I like doing that. I'm not against libraries. Don't worry about it. But I love it. I love it. It's an action that I, I appreciate. I like that at the top part, there's a specialized thing. At the bottom part, there's a generalized thing. With all lines, same thing. It's not much more difficult. It's exactly the same thing, though. Like, I, I would have to make it a bit different. but. It's a similar idea. I like that when I make, like, want to make a list to uh, array to list up there, there's a specialized function. At the bottom, there's something general. I like that if I want to convert to any container, I can still do it with the same syntax in C++. And I, it's not something that makes sense in some other languages. So there's something to learn, but there's a reward. And that reward is, in part, fun. There we go. I hope you enjoyed.